Welcome to everyone who's just joining us. Um, we'll just wait another minute or so so that everyone can access the webinar. Okay, I think I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so hello everyone, uh, my name is Marika and I, um, I'm from the Alumni Office here at King's. Thank you so much to everyone who's joining us today on Zoom um, and welcome to those who are watching us on our KCL YouTube channel as well. Um, for our second webinar with Professor Tim Spector on his forthcoming book, Spoonfed. Um, as you may have seen from our website and communications, we're hosting a series of topical webinars exclusively for our alumni, sharing the work and research of some of our very own leading experts here at King's. You can check out all the past webinars on the alumni YouTube channel, um, as well as the upcoming ones, uh, which are listed on our website. Uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Tim Spector. Professor Spector is the head of the Department of Twin Research and Genetic Epidemiology at King's. As some of you may know from our previous webinar, Professor Spector is leading the work on a pioneering symptom reporting app that aims to slow the spread of the COVID-19 outbreak. Others may know Tim for his groundbreaking first book, The Diet Myth, through his research into microbes, genetics, and diet, Professor Spector has demystified the common misconceptions around fat, calories, vitamins, and nutrients. Today, we'll be hearing about his latest book, Spoonfed, Why Almost Everything We've Been Told About Food is Wrong, where he explores the lack of good science behind many medical and government food recommendations and forces us to rethink our whole relationship with food. His new book will be released on the 27th of August, uh, you can, however, pre-order it on the link that we'll share with you now in the chat. Um, so just a few instructions on the platform. Um, during Tim's presentation, uh, those of you who are on Zoom will be able to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions to us throughout the webinar. You can find the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. When you open it, you'll be able to write your questions. You'll also see other people's questions. Um, so we're really pleased to have so many of you joining us today, um, but this does mean we may not have time to answer all of your questions. We do, however, encourage you to upvote the questions you would like to hear answered by pressing the little thumbs up button um, to like the questions you want to hear the answer to most. Um, so this will help us to choose the most popular questions at the end of the webinar. Now I will hand things over to Professor Tim Spector. Welcome, Tim. Hello there. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and um, um, I'm just going to, oh, I'll, I'll say hello first in person before I go to my slides because people uh, often complain they just see slides. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person with you all. Uh, it's an interesting time for us all. Um, my book was supposed to have been launched uh, um, a few days ago and you could have all been thumbing through it uh, on the, uh, the, the guys' campus and, and mingling together. Um, that hasn't happened, and the book has now been uh, delayed until the end of August. But I'm delighted to be able to come and uh, chat to you and hopefully have some real interaction with the questions, because uh, more than ever, I think this is a really vital uh, subject to discuss and for all of us to become experts in, in, our, in our own way. Um, so I'll, I'll get going and I'm gonna leave plenty of time for uh, uh, questions. Um, and uh, so don't, don't worry about that. I'm just gonna go through very roughly what um, 
is in this incredible subject. And I've changed my talk and you guys are the, the guinea pigs for it. Um, so uh, any mess ups, then, you know, do feel free to complain. Um, so I've changed the, the title really to Spoon Fed in the Age of, of COVID. And I think everything else now is going to have this. This isn't going away as we hoped in just a few weeks. COVID is going to be with us, uh, I think, for several years. And we're going to change the way we uh, live and work uh, in many ways. Uh, not all for the bad. Some will actually be better. Uh, but we can discuss that further on at the end. But I want to tell you a little bit about um, my book first that uh, took several years of my life and I hope doesn't get completely overshadowed by uh, COVID. Um, and this is what you would have seen if you'd come into the lecture theater and seen a pile of the books, uh, these 22 chapters, which are all little small bite-sized chunks and with basically 22 myths about food. First is that nutritional guidelines and diet plans apply to everybody. And I think personalization is a really important theme of, of this book. Um, other ones like breakfast, the most important meal of the day. Uh, we know now that's rubbish. Um, calorie counting, we'll come back to that. Um, obviously fat debate, that's still ongoing. Uh, you think of being put to bed, hasn't. Um, supplements. Uh, artificial sweeteners, uh, food labeling as being a big problem, um, processed foods being bad for us. Um, are they all really as bad as that? And a lot of knocking of meat uh, recently. So what's that like? Um, is it really that true that uh, good cuts of organic meat are bad for us? Um, fish, everyone's pro fish. When I did the evidence, I'm not quite sure it's that's true. And veganism, um, is this the healthiest diet in the world or are there problems? Is it just a lot of hype? Um, salt, I changed my mind about salt. Um, and uh, I, I uh, tested myself. Uh, I think the salt thing is, is vastly overdone for most people. And it's an essential part of cooking that I think uh, we need to rebalance that. Um, big fan of coffee. Um, and we're going to talk a bit about pregnancy advice. Um, the whole idea of everyone having food allergy these days has got even worse than in the last five years, as has the gluten-free fads. Um, and exercise. Uh, the food companies are still pushing uh, the fact that you can drink as much Coca-Cola as you like as long as you exercise. Um, and I think a new area really is about mental health and food and there's increasing evidence of how important that is on our on ourselves and there's clear link between junk foods and depression and uh, and multiple problems and some good evidence now that um, probiotics or a change to a healthy Mediterranean diet has as much impact on someone as uh, taking a standard antidepressant drug. Um, there's, I, I enjoyed the section on, on water in the book. Uh, I learned a lot about water. Um, a total myth that we need to drink eight glasses of water a day. We just don't. Uh, and all these plastic bottles are filling up our oceans. Um, the evidence doesn't, doesn't suggest that drinking alcohol is always bad for you, although that's the simple message that governments give us. Um, I think this whole question of balancing risks is something we're seeing increasingly with COVID as well now. And, um, people need to understand the real risks and know what to worry about. Uh, there's always a spectrum and to label everything the same um, for different categories of drinking is like uh, labeling the risks of COVID being completely uh, the same for some uh, three-year-old toddler and some 93-year-old. Um, I think another interesting bit of the research I, I did was the, uh, this idea that you must always, for food miles, you should always get your food locally. Uh, there's actually quite a few interesting exceptions to that, that uh, uh, 
we can discuss. Uh, sometimes getting some frozen foods shipped in a massive container lorry is better than having lots of small vans uh, uh, close by uh, causing lots of pollution. Um, a big theme that's come up in the last few years are things like herbicides and pesticides. And um, you might have heard of glyphosate, which um, is, being, uh, is the world's most popular herbicide. And some farmers say we couldn't produce all the food without it. Other people say that um, it's interfering with us and our gut microbes and uh, increasing some cancers uh, like Hodgkin, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And in the US, they're awarding people billion dollars worth of damages. Uh, it's a highly controversial subject, but all of us need to know more. And this is all about whether we should be washing our food or not, uh, or um, eating it because it's uh, got a bit of dirt on it and that's good for your microbes. Uh, and finally, um, is it a myth that doctors always know best? Now, of course, I'm saying I'm a doctor, so I always know best, but no one else does. Um, increasingly, uh, that myth, that is a myth because doctors knowledge about nutrition particularly is so poor. Um, you probably get better advice from uh, your uh, hairdresser or uh, cab driver in most occasions. Uh, uh, and I think we do have to really address this lack of education generally, not just in doctors, but in all healthcare workers and in teachers and across society. And I think one of the big things uh, that comes out of my latest research is how much understanding that food is much more complex than we thought is essential. Uh, it is not just about the um, fats, the sugars, the protein and calories. That is a hundred years old and we need to move on. Food is now basically tens of thousands of chemicals that interact with our bodies, with interact with our 20,000 genes and our uh, trillions of microbes and our immune cells in ways that are totally unique. And understanding which chemicals and which food, how they work is something all of us start to need to learn. And also obviously do more playing with food, not just buying processed foods, but understand it by cooking in it. And I think that uh, would be the, the real message going forward is understanding what is good food and what isn't. Um, now, for those of you um, who don't know me well, um, I've uh, up to now only had one really good idea and that was to study twins. Um, after my uh, thesis, when I changed tack and I've been doing that now for uh, nearly 30 years. Uh, it's always good to have one idea as long as it's a it lasts you your career, uh, and that was it. And these are, this is the certainly the biggest in the UK, and the, probably the, certainly the best uh, studied group of twins in the world, uh, and certainly the most successful academic outputs from any twin study in the world, uh, with about eight hundred papers coming out of just this one uh, group of twins, uh, but. Um, the other idea that I think was a good one was when they were closing down the twin uh, unit in uh, mid-March and um, I came up with the idea of uh, being depressed about not having to work on twins for months and just doing a lot of gardening. I said, well, what else can we do? Uh, let's find out if these 10,000 twins are getting symptoms of COVID and see if it's genetic or not. And that's how I came up with the idea of this app, which has become the uh, world's largest citizen science project on health with uh, 3.3 uh, million people um, in the UK now uh, logging on to this and 1.5 million people, hopefully many of you guys, uh, logging in every day talking about uh, symptoms, having a general discussion and understanding about what's going on. And this app, is its success has been phenomenal. And I think it's going to change the way we look at health in the future and interact 
with each other and with doctors and researchers. So that's the big picture. Back to the reality of um, where we are um, in the nutrition world. And, and I thought we'd gone beyond this. I don't know how many of you saw um, a Horizon documentary a, a few weeks ago uh, called The Restaurant That Burns Off Calories. Um, I, along with a couple of other experts, was asked to do cameo pieces and talk about gut microbes and how important they were um, in personalization. But at the beginning of the uh, program and throughout it, they had this theme that had all these people eating in a restaurant and, and behind them, there are all these people in a gym trying to work off all their meals. And it, what seemed like a, a good idea to the producers was a bit of a disaster. Um, PR wise, uh, it encouraged the idea that you can pig yourself out and work it off in the gym. And you can also estimate calories accurately, which of course you can't. So I, this was a hundred years old type uh, science that's still being uh, rebadged as modern stuff uh, by responsible groups like the BBC. So I think the challenge we've got is to, uh, we, there's a lot of work left to be done. Uh, we can't assume that um, people are getting the message out there. And another reason for this book and spreading the word. Um, so one consequence of writing books uh, uh, and is you getting a chance to get out there and talk to people in more in, even more intimate ways than we're doing now is to um, uh, talk about projects. And so um, uh, after one of my talks, the, uh, I got together with um, some entrepreneurs. They came up to me and said, we'd love to work with you. We think there's an amazing uh, study we can do. If we can get the world's biggest nutrition study going, uh, we can uh, do some amazing things together. And this is a company called Zoe. Um, that uh, did this in combination uh, with King's uh, and it ends up, it was a, K a King's spin-off company actually. Um, and uh, they asked me to co-found it with them. Uh, and anyone who offers me uh, millions of pounds to do a, a research study, I'm pretty receptive, um, especially if it was groundbreaking as this. And this is the Predict One Study, which is the largest ever uh, nutritional intervention study. And uh, these guys not only got the money together, uh, these guys in Zoe in, in record time, they also um, assembled a, a, a company that's based just uh, around the corner at the Cut near Waterloo uh, of very gifted people from all kinds of walks of life from physics and other people looking at big data. But essentially, we got this trial of a thousand uh, twins and a hundred people in the US to validate it, gave them all identical meals. They brought them into hospitals and Thomas's. We gave them uh, identical muffins and milkshakes, took these bloods. And you can see um, we, we, we did all these challenges. We looked at their genetics, their blood pressure, their heart rate, gave them questionnaires. We did DEXA scans, look at body fat. We did look to the chemicals in their saliva, their urine, their blood. And then after that exhausting day, they were sent home and uh, were given a food diary, which is in the form of an app. And this is where the expertise of Zoe and the apps come in and given a number of standard meals uh, to look at by themselves. And we looked at effects of things like physical activity and sleep monitoring. And of course, we got poo samples at the beginning and end. And this has never been done before in more than about 10 people. So uh, we were looking comprehensively because uh, they also had glu these glucose monitors that um, I would have shown you in person uh, have revolutionized this whole area of nutrition. So you can, for, for two weeks, you can see exactly what effect food is having on your sugar levels. And we're also taking blood spot tests to look at um, what happens to fat levels. And this basic slide sums it up. Everybody was unique. When we looked at the blood profiles of people after eating identical meals over a whole day or 
uh, even further, nobody had the same profiles, even identical twins. So there's so many factors in how we respond to food that have been ignored. And we know this is important because uh, we know that how much your, uh, your sugar peaks after a meal or your uh, triglycerides, your fat in the blood peaks, has a big effect on your metabolism, has an effect on your appetite, has effect on inflammation, and probably also many other things we don't understand. So the idea that you can, just by telling people how many calories or fat are in something, uh, generalize it to everybody is complete nonsense. And that's what we're, we're showing here. Now, um, obviously there's a huge study in this paper, uh, for those who are interested, should be coming out uh, in the next four weeks in Nature Medicine. Um, and it does show this uniqueness. Uh, we looked at the genetics, because obviously we have the twins, uh, showed only a fraction uh, of uh, the responses to food were down to our genes. Um, there was some element in, in responding to sugar, which sort of it explains a bit the diabetes angle and the um, pre-diabetes angle. But when it came to how you digest fats, virtually none of that uh, was genetic at all. It was all environmental or uh, due to other factors like your, your gut microbes uh, or other parts of uh, what was going on, uh, your fasting levels. Exercise was important, but again, people reacted very differently. Um, some people's sugars went down on exercise, others actually went up. We found importance of, of sleep. Um, and uh, this seemed to have an effect on the inflammation levels and your sugar and fat levels. Um, and food timing is another one. So you, if you delayed your, your breakfast, um, you've got a different response. Uh, and if you could extend the time you weren't eating, that seemed to be beneficial for most people, but not everybody. And so it looks like, like some people might be breakfast eaters uh, naturally and others uh, would be better off skipping their uh, breakfast. We didn't show that many differences between uh, males and females, interestingly. Uh, the uniqueness is, is more important. Uh, but the gut microbiome was a big factor, and we now have identified certain microbes that uh, are key for differences between healthy and unhealthy uh, responses. And, um, but I think the, the key thing is there's many factors that determine how you respond to food, and it's not just about what you eat, it's how you eat it, how quickly, the food intervals, the timing of it, how much you sleep, how much you exercise, and all this can now be put into an app and examined with our new methods of artificial intelligence. Um, and the similarities of nutrition and um, our responses to the COVID virus are really quite interesting because um, we've, a lot of the population have been exposed to this virus. Um, we imagine about probably total exposure is probably about 6 million people have, have been exposed with about 4 million showing uh, symptoms. And everyone knows that this can be from very trivial amounts of exposure to um, ending up in death. And um, the this app has, uh, I think, revolutionized our view of the disease. Now, we had no idea it was going to be this successful. Uh, I thought a few thousand people might download it. Uh, if we were lucky, uh, never dreamt we'd get, be getting over 3 million people, over 1 in 20 people in the UK, uh, which is absolutely phenomenal. And this allows gives incredible power to understand a disease in its entirety. And in the same way as with nutrition, people tell us, you know, it's all about carbs, fat, and uh, protein. Uh, the government and, and, and public health, uh, people are telling us that the virus is, is like flu. It's just about cough and fever. That's, and I think one reason this app was so successful um, was that we, 
were interested in people's responses. We wanted to know all their symptoms. We now uh, have up to 17 symptoms listed on the app that people can record. And it may not be uh, actual COVID, but by only by collecting data on people who are logging every day, whether they're well or not, do we get these answers? And we showed um, uh, straight away, within a week, we knew from the app, just after when we had a million people, which was we got after a few days, we had all these people reporting loss of smell, uh, which is not something you get with any other flu. It's pretty obvious. It's, it's a unique um, symptom. And the second most, uh, and, and, we, and the, the, these are the range of um, symptoms we're seeing. And we published this uh, a few weeks ago in, in Nature Medicine, um, which is fairly incredible for those academics in there to start a study and then uh, publish it um, less than eight weeks later in a, in a journal like Nature. It does show you something about the speed of modern science. Um, and we showed that loss of smell had this most strong prediction with um, being positive with a swab test because of our 3 million participants, we have about 130,000 now have had swab tests. And the Department of Health are really helping us now. Anyone who's logging on for a week as normal and then logs on with a symptom is getting an invite for a swab test. And this allows us to say uh, which symptoms are associated most strongly with a swab test and which are not. So all of these are associated with some level, um, but the most distinctive is loss of smell because you've got fever here. Um, these, uh, this is the UK and this is the US, but um, fever is, is a symptom, but it, it can come with other things. So it's not that distinctive. And chest pain again, is rather non-specific, so uh, like abdominal pain. But this list is growing, and um, I think this is really important as we expand our idea of what the virus is. We're also able to get um, an idea that people are, 10% of people have the disease for more than three weeks, 5% have it for more than um, uh, a month. Um, and what do COVID-19 and nutrition have in common? Um, well, they both involve multiple lifestyle choices every day. Um, we all know now that how, you know, do I go to the supermarket? Uh, do I wear a mask? Do I wash my hands? Um, how close shall I go to somebody? Um, is it safe to do this? What will they think? We're constantly uh, making these decisions that we didn't have to make before. And, that's very similar to our choices about food. Uh, what am I gonna have as a snack? Am I gonna have milk in my coffee? Um, all these things are very similar. Um, the one size fits all advice and the government doesn't work. Um, I think uh, I've explained that why that's true for food. Um, for COVID, um, following the government advice for the last uh, two months has meant we've ignored uh, an obvious sign of the disease, um, which is the uh, loss of sense of smell and many others, because our algorithm by combining them can actually give a uh, much better prediction than just fever or cough. Uh, if everyone used the app, we'd have a much better prediction of what was going on. But um, they said, uh, people aren't very clever. They can't understand more than one message. And I, to be honest, at the beginning of the outbreak, it was fairly chaotic, so um, it was reasonable. But after a few weeks, realizing that other, as other countries have done, we should have a, be more inclusive in what we call this disease, um, we've worked out that there were 16% of people that um, had loss of smell that never got fever or cough. And so we're going around infecting people and probably still are. Uh, the government data suggests that was only 2%, but they haven't showed where they got their data from. Uh, so again, uh, public health bodies and governments in general try to keep things simple, keep guidelines simple, keep one size fits all. COVID advice really doesn't work the same for uh, people in care homes and uh, children. And we do need 
much more flexibility, more understanding of individual responses. Interestingly, genes play a small role in this variability. We've got a twin study out uh, showing that some of the symptoms are under um, some genetic control, but it's definitely not the whole answer to COVID. And we've discussed that with food. I think gut microbes are going to be shown uh, to play a role. We know that uh, in food, they are important. And because they're so individual, we now know there are certain microbes that do associate with um, uh, fats, for example, uh, uh, how you digest fats. And we're even showing um, that some people have a parasite in, in them. 30% uh, of, of you guys probably have a parasite um, that normally you wouldn't want, but this one actually digests fat better, reduces inflammation and keeps you thin. So we're learning incredible things about the microbes and I suspect they have a, an important role in COVID that hasn't been proven yet. But the risk factors are quite similar uh, for having poor gut health or a poor response to COVID, being overweight, having diabetes, a poor diet and lack of sleep. A, Artificial intelligence methods are useful as are, and we can now predict them with an app. Um, so uh, the company Zerm working with has uh, uh, an app for food that it's going to be tested commercially in the US next month. And we're trying this, this free app, uh, which hope to be available for many countries soon. Um, and the fact we make these multiple choices uh, every day. Um, briefly touch on a few food myths just to whet your appetite, maybe for the questions. Um, I say that supplements don't work. And when I say that, it's, it's like saying, um, I like to kill dogs uh, to the British public. I, never, I get hate mail and uh, it's as if I've, I've uh, transgressed some terrible line. And in the last five years, my strength in this has actually increased. And there's even less evidence that these work but actually sales have probably doubled in the last five years. And they're particularly gone up at the moment because of COVID. Uh, people do take a lot of comfort in, in these. Uh, they're probably likely to be placebo, but in the app, I'm a scientist, I'm prepared to be wrong. And remember, I did used to believe in vitamins. I was a big vitamin D fan, um, but now they don't even work in osteoporosis. I'm not so sure. Um, we're doing a study in the app that should tell us fairly soon whether we're going to introduce it next year, whether any of these, vit these vitamins people are saying uh, really work. There's a big difference between association and causation. Now, we've touched on fish, um, and um, uh, I, 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 I think we are overdoing, we're overselling fish as the cure for the human race. Um, if we did have our, everyone had two portions a week, uh, we, the fish industry would wipe out uh, all our stocks uh, within about six months, probably for good. So we need to think about that. And obviously there's a lot of pollution in fish and the data, it doesn't really stack up about it being healthy for you. Um, and baked beans, um, laughed at, they're seen as a processed food, but not all processed food is bad. And baked beans are a lot better than many other foods. And there's many other examples of canned foods, etc. Um, that are uh, good for you, canned tomatoes, uh, canned lentils, and frozen foods as well. So those shiny, bright, luminous uh, peas, uh, actually quite nutritious. And uh, often it's a good idea to freeze things. You don't lose anything uh, from that. So we shouldn't be snobby about things in tins or frozen. Uh, and we do have a, have a better understanding of processed foods in general because um, uh, there's a whole range, you know, cheese, as you, as, as you know, I'm a big fan of, but by definition, it's processed. It's not ultra processed, although some uh, cheese is. Uh, and we need to start understanding what the very worst foods are and perhaps have a new ranking system for looking at that. But don't throw everything away. Uh, I think we need to understand what the good and bad bits of processing are, because Processing is definitely something we can't avoid and not every chemical is bad uh, because food is naturally made up of chemicals. It's things that perhaps shouldn't be there that our body isn't necessarily used to. 
Uh, another little vignette here. Uh, I'm guessing there are some, some of you out there who've uh, been pregnant at some time and had diet advice and thought, oh, that seems quite sensible because that's what my mum did or whatever. Um, we asked about 40 uh, nutritionists specializing in maternity around different countries to give us their advice. And surprise, surprise, everything's different. There was virtually no agreement on them about whether you should have uh, soft cheeses, um, sushi, coffee, alcohol, and uh, even some countries recommended not giving up cigarettes because it would make you stressed. Um, so the fact there's so many different advice out there means that nobody really know, understands the answer and we should stop uh, stressing out pregnant women who've got enough to worry about and basically just uh, relax some of these, these rigid guidelines that have absolutely no uh, basis uh, scientifically. And it's another lesson we should be learning from other countries more. And I think we're seeing that in COVID, how in this country, we're very behind the curve. Um, we impose rules. The two meter distance is one meter in um, uh, France and 1.5 meters in other countries, but rules about disinfectants and hand washes and different countries, as you know, have different symptoms. You know, let's, let's not be so proud and let's uh, start embracing what other people in the world uh, do and not just laugh at them. Um, so I think I'll um, uh, shut up and ask uh, uh, you guys to start some of this interaction. Um, I think my main conclusion from this is that whether it's for COVID or it's for um, nutrition, we're all unique. We all need to know more. We need to educate each other and learn how best to uh, work together to stay healthy. Thank you very much. I'll stop. Thank you very much for that uh, sneak peek insight into what to expect from your book and uh, also uh, very interesting information on the app. Um, I think we'll now uh, we've got some questions lined up from the audience. Um, Francine, did you want to ask Tim some of those questions on behalf of the audience? Yes, um, I would want to say congratulations on behalf of the audience for the app first, Tim. Um, Big team effort, I should say. So um, there are about 70 people uh, in the Zoe team and at King's uh, working on this. And... Uh, you know, the Zoe team uh, came up with this app. They developed it themselves. They did it all in four days, when it normally takes um, four months, working okay. night and day to get this ready on the day of lockdown. And uh, once, they, once the data started coming in, you know, uh, our team at King's and also in, in the engineering uh, data team as well, have all pulled together and we've made lots of fantastic collaborations working together. So it's been a great feeling of teamwork. So I, I was just the, I'm just the spokesperson. I don't do much of the work. Well, that's very much impressive. Um, congratulations to all of the team. Um, you did mention at the beginning that there's about 22 myths about food. And some of the people in the audience are asking if there are any universal truths about food. Is there a universal truth? Only for yourself, I guess, is the fact. So, um, you know, there's probably no such thing as something that's universally bad. Um, and I think we all have to learn where we are in the spectrum uh, and uh, be pragmatic in this. So I think what it's taught me is that, you know, there isn't... Uh, not only isn't there one size fits all, I don't think there's a sort of perfect diet, um, even for yourself. And I think we just have to have some basic general rules. Um, mm -hmm. Realize there's a balance between sometimes between healthiness and pleasure, um, which is often forgotten because if you can, you can get great pleasure out of food uh, that lifts your mood, that's also incredibly important. And uh, we mustn't let get obsessed about uh, nutrients and diet and clean eating and these kind of things. 
So that, that, that partly answers that question. So um, and I think we're still learning. I think the first thing is to break the mold of the old idea that uh, it's very simple and it's these macronutrients. The next year is going to unfold, uh, you know, about personalized nutrition and how we can work that into our lives without it messing up our lives. I think that's the big challenge. Great, thank you. Um, we've had a few questions about fastening, uh, including one from Susie Ladder. Um, so, what are your views on intermittent fasting, time restricted eating? Is there an optimal length of period to fast and an optimal time of day? Um, are there any research on eating five small meals a day, spaced apart two to three hours, but with a fasting window of 14 hours overnight? Okay, there's a few questions in there, but I'll answer generally. Uh, so yeah, so intermittent fasting. So I think five years ago, um, So five, the 5-2 five intermittent fasting was quite a big, big thing. Mm -hmm. Michael Mosley's in it, in it, book publicizing it heavily. Um, and things have evolved a bit since then to be um, talking not just about uh, two days a week eating less, uh, but actually the timing of when you eat being uh, more important. So. I'm generally a believer in intermittent fasting for most people. My experience is that people do often, if you do want to uh, lose weight, you can keep the same nutritious diet. You just um, teach your body to start responding to less food uh, two days a week um, when you're busy and you, you know, you're not sitting by the fridge all day. Um, that works very well or in lockdown. It's probably quite hard. <laughs> yeah, very uh, hard. But, um, Uh, we keep going past the fridge or the biscuit um, drawer. But um, I think the new, the new thinking is that extending fasting uh, really does work. You have exactly the same meals, uh, same total food in a day, but you compress the time you're eating. Because <clears throat> over, over our history, we've gone from perhaps eating one big meal a day to two, and then the Victorians introduced breakfast. And Now, with American-style publicity, we're, we're eating about, on average, between five and six meal episodes um, a day, which means we're, ne we're never in this uh, fasting state. And if we're eating a, a little snack at night, some people you know, are only getting eight, eight hours uh, without food, and um, that's not enough. And so there's a lot of studies now showing that if you can increase that fasting period to... Uh, certainly over 12 hours and optimally 14 hours that allows your body to recover and metabolize better and it seems to involve the gut microbes that they like this period it allows them to repair your gut and send out um, helpful chemicals for your immune system etc so I think that's definitely going to be a big thing um, uh, in the future Uh, and people will go back to this idea of having bigger meals or limiting the time. Now, some people do better when they skip breakfast and some people will do better when they either skip or bring their evening meal forward. And, and there are some people who don't eat during the day. Um, often I skip lunch, for example. I find that easier or I'll skip breakfast. I find it really hard to skip my evening meal. So I think we're finding that there are these Uh, diurnal patterns that are unique to each of us but the key is really if you're going to have a snack have it right next to your meal don't break up your day with uh, little snacks because mm -hmm. um, that upsets your metabolism and the whole uh, you can't recover your gut microbes don't like it and that's this theory that I think is going to is the evidence is very strong for it and I think it's going to be uh, very big for the next few years Great, thank you. But I, I think that's one thing I'm mean about snacking is bad. So I'll, I'll keep Yeah, it so up. there's no such thing as a healthy snack. We're, we're told, oh, okay, just snack healthy, give your kids a healthy snack. Actually, much better to give them extra food around mealtime um, you know, rather than make sure they're eating every two hours. This is a totally modern phenomenon. 
Uh, when I went to school, I was never given snacks, uh, whereas mothers uh, and parents feel guilty if their kids haven't got a whole load of stuff to get them through the day, uh, you know, until lunchtime. And basically, we need to teach all of us to go longer without eating. And this is mm -hmm. helped by the intermittent fasting uh, plan as well, which psychologically is a very useful thing that everyone should do once in a while, even if they feel perfectly healthy. Okay, so we'll see how many people try <laughs> intermittent fasting now. Um, we've There's got another meeting just so they don't... So the new thing is called rest... RTE, is the, it's the new word for it. Uh, this this form of eating. So you need you can actually eat exactly the same. You just have it at uh, at different times. Great. Um, thank you, Tim. Uh, we've got another question about uh, the fermented food trend. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? What are your thoughts on taking probiotic supplements? And uh, have we got any research on how much other probiotic foods might be enough? Um, how much cheese, yogurt, sauerkraut do you really need? Okay, well, that's the whole book, really. So, um, <laughs> uh, the short answer is I think anyone who knows me, I'm a big fan of fermented foods. Uh, to try and get at least one shot of some fermented food every day. And don't forget that good quality cheese is fermented food, as well as good quality yogurt without the sugars and the um, artificial chemicals in it and without all the uh, extra stuff in the low fat stuff. So normal, uh, regular yogurts, uh, cheeses, if you can get artisan cheese that's made with unpasteurized stuff, that's great, but there's many other good ones uh, that are used pasteurized that's still fine. Um, I'm a big fan of kefir, um, which is now mm -hmm. common. It wasn't five years ago when the diet myth came out. No one had heard of it. Uh, now it's in most uh, supermarkets and shops, which is like super yogurt. Basically, you get uh, five times the amount of microbes in, um, in, in kefir as you do in yogurt. So just a small shot every morning or add it to your yogurt if you don't like the slightly more bitter taste or sour taste, I should say. Uh, I am a big fan of uh, kombucha. I make my own fermented tea. And again, you just have a small shot of it. And there's often about 30 different microbes in those. Um, and uh, don't forget sauerkraut and kimchi. Uh, there's a theory going around that the South Koreans have done so well with COVID is that they basically have kimchi, uh, which is this fermented cabbage and garlic uh, three times a day. Um, I'm not doing a President Trump and telling you to have to have it, but um, <laughs> just a thought. Um, the, uh, uh, I have it. It's great. <laughs> uh, the, um, so uh, and generally, I'm a big fan of uh, fermented foods rather than fermented capsules or tablets. And so the equivalent, which is, which is probiotics. Um, probiotics have their place, but I, I, people should really go for the real food instead because... Mm -hmm. Don't totally know whether all these probiotics uh, make it, uh, how the quality of what you're eating, uh, the quality of the, um, how alive they are. Uh, but there's no doubt in general they work. Um, there's not much evidence they work in very healthy people, but they do work if you're, um, you're sick, you're infirm, you've got uh, other problems, uh, travel, sickness or whatever, uh, or... Uh, and mm -hmm. they do work with antibiotics, so there's some debate at the moment on whether you should take them before or afterwards, uh, and that's still not clear. The other problem with probiotics is we don't really know which ones to take. Um, so that's why if you can just take fermented foods instead, I think you're better off. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question about um, what radical policies uh, the UK government could introduce to deal with the epidemic of obesity, which is having a devastating impact on the health of our nation um, and also to relieve the burden on the NHS? Right. So I'm being asked to come up with a radical policy. Is that right? <laughs> to deal with the obesity. Yes. 
Oh, well, okay, well, I would probably, um, uh, I would subsidize healthy foods like fruits and vegetables. Um, I would tax uh, ultra processed foods in the same way we tax uh, alcohol and cigarettes. And mm -hmm. uh, I would uh, make uh, food and nutrition a compulsory part of education uh, up to the age of 21. Okay. That's simple, uh, wasn't it? Easy. So that was the- Yeah, um, that's <laughs> very easy, I guess. Um, you were mentioning earlier that um, it's a myth to trust doctors. Um, so what about nutritionists and dietitians? Um, why do you feel that sit in terms of who we should go to for advice? Um, and I guess you did just say that it would be good for everyone to have a knowledge of that until we're 21, so. Yeah, so. Um, uh, if the question is mainly about how do you how do you find a good nutritionist or dietitian, so it, it's hard in this country because we're also divided uh, the whole area into dietitians who generally work in hospitals with hospital patients, generally with people who are defined as having an illness, but at the moment obesity is not defined as an illness, uh, although it should be. Um, the, um, so dietitians are very focused on uh, subsets of the population, but not really on uh, more healthy people who are overweight or uh, obese. And uh, the other group is, is nutritionists, which is less, and there's three or four different colleges and ways of getting accreditation as a nutritionist, um, but are not properly organized. So this means that you do find um, some very good nutritionists and I know lots and I work with them, uh, but other ones that do lack some of that education and skill. And I think uh, there's no clear way to do this other than seeing that someone's been on a uh, perhaps a degree course and a master's mm -hmm. and um, you've asked someone up, you know, and they've got good recommendations. Uh, but it is tricky. Uh, and there's also a tendency that some uh, uh, universities have very dominant departments and they all get taught whatever the professor believes rather than a whole variety of views. Um, I think that the situation is improving, um, but uh, we still don't have enough uh, dietitians and nutritionists to inform everyone about food, mm -hmm. which is comes back to this point that we all have to learn more ourselves. Uh, and we, it should be part of formal education because uh, you can't rely on the small number of doctors and nutritionists around to inform us all. But um, I think uh, for people who do have particular problems, you know, getting an assessment by a nutritionist is, is, is often worthwhile and gives you a different perspective. Um, so, uh, but I think we all have to become our own nutritionists, basically. That's the. Uh, <laughs> well, if we read more of your books, maybe we'll learn more about nutrition and yeah, maybe that will change something. Well, I'm I'm going to uh, have a good look at your book once if <laughs> it's been released before. Um, we've got a question about uh, the COVID nineteen app. Um, do, sorry. Does the app include the question on diet to see whether or not that has an impact on uh, the symptoms? Uh, very good question. Um, at the moment, we've just got questions on obesity and diabetes. Mm -hmm. uh, we've shown do uh, interesting double your risk of getting symptoms. We don't understand why. Uh, so it makes you more susceptible to be symptomatic. And we don't know whether that is because the virus just hangs around in you more or you just react to it more. Um, uh, and we do know that also that feeds through and so you're more likely to have serious complications 
if you've got obesity or diabetes, but our study is one of the first to show in the population that's a problem. Um, so as I said, we're following up with questions about vitamin supplements um, mm -hmm. next week on the app. And I think we're trying to get some uh, questions on diet. The problem is uh, in an app, it's very hard to you know, sort of one line answer, uh, understand the complexity of uh, an app. So what we're, we're considering and be interested to see what people think is if we had a, an option that said, uh, click here and you can then go on to an on, another web page where you, you can fill out about your diet, uh, that would be accepted. So that's what we're thinking of doing, uh, having a sort of one line click through uh, to ask about diet that way. And in the same way we might do for mental health as well, because it's very hard to have a single question about the state of your mind that uh, doesn't make it too trivial. Uh, and that's obviously the trade-off, you know, we get data on 3 million people, but it's, you know, people have got to answer it and they get very fed up if it's too cumbersome. So <clears throat> we think we've already got too many questions in the app. We're gonna to have to dump some, which upsets some, some of the researchers in order to put more in. So we've got to start cleaning up uh, the app. But we, we definitely want to ask about this, ask about mm -hmm. gut health, uh, and uh, it's just working out the best way to do it. Okay, thank you. Um, we have seen an increase in uh, genuine food allergies. Um, do you think this statement is true? And if so, could you offer an explanation for this? So what, what allergies? Um, food allergies in general. Uh, food allergies in general. So uh, is it true that we're seeing food allergies? Uh, yes, uh, it is real. Um, uh, but uh, many people think they have food allergies and they don't. So yes, there is a real increase in the last uh, 20 years in food allergies. Uh, and, and the types of allergies have changed from the past. Uh, asthma isn't as common as it was, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and food allergies have, have increased as, uh, and uh, we think that uh, it, it's probably because people's gut microbes have got worse over that time. Okay. Uh, uh, we don't really understand why but maybe the immune system is not as uh, tolerant as it was uh, because people are in a way eating less diverse foods. And so the least diverse your food is, the least diverse your gut microbes are, the least diverse your immune response. And so increasingly people have been concerned about, oh, you know, this food or that food uh, particularly in children saying, you know, as children are having more and more restricted diets, um, that seems to be the problem. So interesting, the whole question about nut allergies, uh, which is peanut allergy. Uh, 20 years ago, everyone was taught to avoid peanuts uh, in pregnancy and young kids because they get allergic. And it seems to be that was probably the opposite, uh, the wrong advice. And the more you restrict foods, worrying about them in early, early life, uh, the less gut microbes are able to diversify and mm -hmm. end up with more immune problems. That's just a theory, but uh, I was asked for my, uh, my theory. It seems as good as any. So I think we, the only way to reverse this is by going diversify diets. Okay, so yes, you avoid, can And avoid junk food and chemicals. I mean, that's the other stuff here that you know, you've got the good stuff, you know, diversity and the bad stuff, which is low diversity and high chemical stuff that interferes with our, our gut microbes. Okay, so super diverse diets, everyone is unique as well, I think, are two key points uh, from your presentation. Um, would you like to share anything else before we end the webinar too? Um, well, I think that the keys to a healthy diet, um, I do have a, a, a sort of 10 point list at the end of my book, which I, I've now forgotten because of my, all my COVID stuff, but the, uh, so I do apologize, but I think we've covered most of them. Um, so try and eat 30 different plants 
um, a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's a pretty good rule. And remember that a plant can also be uh, uh, a herb, uh, it can be nuts, it can be seeds. And I often sprinkle nuts and seeds as a quick way of getting uh, more into my system uh, on a daily basis onto my yogurt. Um, have regular fermented foods every day. Um, try and avoid artificial sweeteners. Um, uh, go for high polyphenol foods, uh, brightly colored ones. Uh, things that uh, like in dark chocolate, coffee, olive oil, mm -hmm. and berries, and um, uh, experiment with uh, uh, f fasting, intermittent, and changing your time, skipping breakfast. It may be good for you. The evidence points to that generally being good. Uh, just try it. You know, everyone has to do their own uh, kind of experiments. And above all, educate yourself uh, about food and nutrition and uh, help educate the world in that way. And I think increasingly important, if you do that, we're gonna improve our immune systems. And at the moment, we all need the best immune systems money can buy. Great, thank you very much, Tim. Okay, thank you everybody. It's been a pleasure and hope to see you in real life soon. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, I think that brings our uh, webinar to close a few mm. notes from me um firstly uh, a huge thank you uh to tim who's kindly given his t um time today uh, i hope you all found this webinar interesting and we do encourage you to pre-order spoon fed if you'd like to learn more um if you have any questions about anything that was shared today um please don't hesitate to get in touch with the alumni office by emailing us or on our social media channels um, as I mentioned, you'll be able to find this and our past webinars on the alumni YouTube channel. Please feel free to share these uh, and don't forget to use hashtag Forever Kings. Um, we hope you've been enjoying the brand new website so far. We're also thrilled to announce we've just launched our first ever digital version of our alumni magazine in touch. So do be sure to check that out. That's online today. Um, other upcoming events, we've got our second virtual alumni versus student pub quiz on the 28th of May. Uh, do be sure to get your team together and join us for that. A very interesting uh, panel of experts lined up to discuss the impact of the pandemic on the arts and culture sector on June 4th and a training session uh, to, <laughs> to guide you on building success with your LinkedIn profile on the 17th of June um and lots more so please uh check out those uh, events on our website and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon once again a huge thank you to tim for joining us today and thank you all for listening thank you very much